and that it protects those who stand alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we stand along His side truly, brothers and sisters? When one sees the way the Prophet used to treat the slaves and the captives, again, you will become speechless. The Prophet did not leave anyone outside of his compassion and mercy. Here is Bilal, radiallahu anhu, and I am so proud to be named after Bilal. An Ethiopian slave who used to exist at the time of the Prophet Insignificant man, meaning towards the tribes. And he was a slave with Umayyah. Umayyah, la'natullahi alayhi. Bilal radiallahu anhu, when he embraced Islam in secret, Umayyah found out his, his Lord, the one who bought him, the one who had him and owned him. He said, I own your soul, I own your wealth, I own everything that you say. You're not allowed to become a Muslim. He said, there is only one God. So Umayyah brought him in the scorching sand and placed him in the middle of the desert and placed a stone over his chest. Brothers and sisters, the sand over there in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, the sand is more than 60 degrees Celsius. It will burn you back easily. It will peel off your skin. And then with a with a stone so heavy, so large that needs four men to carry it, was placed on his chest and then he was whipped, saying, Say that our, our idols are the best. And he would say, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. There's only one God, there's only one God. Suddenly, as he was almost about to kill, kill Bilal radiallahu anhu, a man by the name of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Habibi Abu Bakr, he arrived and he said, The messenger has sent me, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I will buy this man off you, ya Umayyah. How much do you want for him? Name the price. And Umayyah said to him, he said, I'll give him a bit of a high price. He said, I want ten golden dinars. Everyone laughed around him. Suddenly he threw the sack in front of him. Ten golden dinars. Umayyah looked up and he said, What a fool you are. You think that you've accomplished something here? I would have asked two dinars for this worthless person. He's worth nothing. You just bought a worthless person for ten dinars. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, The Messenger sallam said, or Abu Bakr himself said, who was being taught by the Messenger Wasallam, I would have paid a hundred dinars for him. I would have paid a hundred. And Umayyah was darkened in his face and thought, damn, I could have made another ninety golden dinars. <laughs> slaves are valuable in Islam. And the first people who followed the Prophet Wasallam were the slaves and servants and the weak. Then the leaders followed, such as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Abu Abayd ibn Jarrah, Umar radiallahu anhu and the rest. The Prophet used to promise great rewards in paradise for people who bought slaves and set them free. Or bought women slaves and set them free and then had the choice of marrying them or letting them free. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Wail, meaning a place in hellfire, Wail to those who harm their servants, hit them, bash them. And he said, every servant must be fed from the food that you feed your family with. Must be given shelter and comfort. Must be allowed to do these things. So much so that one time Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, Abu Dhar made a mistake one time. His servant, he had a servant. And he did something wrong. So Abu Dhar slapped him across the face. Suddenly Abu Dhar heard a voice from behind him. A voice saying to him, do you not fear the hellfire because of this weak person in front of you? Abu Dhar looked back, wanting to answer back, and the Prophet said to him, and he found the Prophet before him. It was the Messenger. And he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, he is for free for the sake of Allah. I, I've set him free. The Prophet said, If you did not set him free, Allah would have punished you in the fire. Subhanallah. Which religion in the world or ideology or, or, or system? I ask you in the name of Allah. Which system in the world has this mercy and its sensitivity to even the slaves like that? Who? Which, which religion? Not one. Islam honored them and lifted them until Bira radiallahu anhu was the caller to the adhan which we call today. The Prophet ﷺ was even compassionate towards the animals and the insects. One time, they were out towards a battle. Suddenly the Prophet ﷺ stopped the whole army. And he said, there is a bird above me fluttering. Why is the bird fluttering above you, Ya Rasulullah? He said, she is crying because someone has taken her babies from its nest. Who took them? And a young man came along and said, Ya Rasulullah, I did. The Prophet ﷺ said, why? 
Why do you want to hurt the feelings of this mother by taking her children? Return them back. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, anyone who, ha- who kills a bird for no reason, on the day of judgment it will come to Allah crying and saying, my Lord, your servant so and so killed me and he had no reason for killing me. Now, which... The Prophet ﷺ The Prophet ﷺ forbid the killing of animals and insects without a reason and he specialized the ants and the bees because they are mentioned in the Qur'an. He also specialized the woodpecker because it is also mentioned in the Qur'an. And the Prophet ﷺ also specialized the frog because we have a story about the frog when Ibrahim, our Prophet Ibrahim ﷺ was thrown into the fire by his people. The frog, what can a frog do? If it comes close to the fire, it'll, if its skin dries up, it's dead. It has to always be moist. So from the pond, it tried to hop as close as it can to a fire that's six stories high. It would get water from the pond and just spit it out, trying to extinguish the fire. Because of that, yes brothers and sisters, the frog can't do that. But this is a lesson to us Muslims, that you are to do what is within your ability, even if it cannot benefit. Do within your ability. Allah does not tell you to do things that are beyond your ability. So here is the frog. And because it did that, even though it did nothing, Allah forbid the killing of any frog for any reason until the end of time. Abadan. If I find the frog in my bed, in my pillow, in my mouth, Allah, I wouldn't kill it. Now, I just remembered my sister-in-law. I think she is amongst us. Now the reason why I remember it is because she's so passionate towards animals' rights. But she eats a lot of uh, beef and lamb as well. So I don't know where that came from. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ was so compassionate even to the non-Muslim enemies and their children. Here's an important point for me which I would like to discuss with you. We've already heard some examples about how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with a non-Muslim old lady. That's by default. Well, what about every other non-Muslim enemy, friend or foe? Allah says in the Quran, لا إكراه في الدين. There is no compulsion in religion. So the Prophet ﷺ could not compel anyone. Also, Allah also says, إنما أنت منذر. You are only but a warner. That's all you can do, a messenger of God. Allah also says to him, فذكر إن he said, remind, if the reminders will benefit, those who want to accept, those whose hearts are open, they will accept. Allah also says in the Qur'an, to the Prophet Lest You are not allowed to force them or compel them. So, where did people get the notion that Muslims were commanded or Islam was spread with the sword. Wallahi, any person who's, be careful, any person who says that, and you meet with a historian, Muslim or non-Muslim, or somebody who is educated in this area, they will laugh at you. They will laugh at you and mock you. But unfortunately, there's too many ignorant people out there. Those who read history, you will never find that Islam was spread through the sword. How could it be? It's, it's, it makes no sense. If you can't become a Muslim unless you really sincerely believe it from your heart, how can I force you into Islam? You're not a Muslim. In fact, you become more dangerous to me because I will think you're a Muslim, but in fact, you're just a hypocrite hiding and spying on me. You could harm me more than anyone else. So this notion is pathetic. Impossible. Having said this, the Prophet wasallam used to have a Jewish neighbor. You know how... You know, Muslims are about, you know, culturally we hate Jews and we mock Jews and, and things like that. Well, this is wrong. From, these are, comes on, from only ignorant people. Christians or Muslims or whoever they are. The Prophet ﷺ did not generalize and he treated every individual alone. He had a Jewish neighbor and the Prophet ﷺ used to experience some harm from him. So he used to place his rubbish in front of the Prophet's house very frequently and the Prophet peace be upon him used to clean it up. One day or a few days passed one time there was no rubbish in front of the Prophet's house. So the Prophet peace be upon him understood that something's wrong with his neighbor. And Jibreel alayhi salam had told him to be dutiful to the neighbor to the point where the Prophet thought that Jibreel is about to tell him and when you die, your neighbor has to take everything you have. The Prophet went and visited the Jewish man and he found him sick. The Jewish man asked, how did you know I was 
harmed. How did you know I was sick? The Prophet ﷺ said to him, well, the only way I knew is because of your rubbish. <laughs> the Jewish neighbor became a Muslim, ya akhwa. And he bared witness that he is the messenger of God. Our character. The Prophet ﷺ, when he went into a battle, like fighting, when he was forced into fighting, he had to fight. After 14 years of persecution, they forced him to fight them in a battle because if he didn't fight them back, they were going to kill him and the people with him. And I would like to make a little term understandable here. A lot of pe- people think, when they read verses in the Quran about fighting and battles and war, they think they read it wrong. When Allah SWT says, for example, قَاتِلُوهُمْ Fight them. They interpret it as saying, kill them, massacre them, attack them. قَاتِلُوا means to fight back. When someone fights you, you engage in fighting back. This is called qital. Mutual fighting. When someone, it's because Allah SWT says, do not attack, Allah does not like the people who attack. But qatilu, meaning if they start you, then fight them back. Don't sit there and let them massacre you, because then Islam will be stopped from spreading. And the weak people will be oppressed by these villains, these terrorists. Now, so the Prophet said when he went out to a battle, he used to stop his companions and give them a valuable lesson. And the battle was never ever practiced. No wars were practiced for 14 years. Does anyone know why? I would like to ask that question from anybody here in the audience. Does anyone know why? The major reason why 14 years battle was not commanded. That's number one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow it. But I'm asking the reason why Allah did not allow it yet. Does anyone? Sorry? Okay, that's number one. To implement Tawheed. But still, they had Tawheed from the word go. There was something a little bit more than that within Tawheed. That comes with Tawheed. I'll give you a clue. Wars have conditions in Islam, don't they? And when you're in a battle and people are charging and you see your brother and your sister, your brother and your sister and your father and your uncle bleeding to death, would you be in the right state of mind? Would you be able to respect the conditions of war? No. So now does anyone still know why? The Sorry? Good try, brother, but I don't think that's the answer, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. That's it. To fight only for the sake of Allah, in other words, to instill the etiquettes of manners and patience in their hearts. Because when you're out in battle, you have to respect the conditions of fighting. Abadan. One companion, he was out fighting the man, he was about to kill another man. And then the man struck him with his sword that hurt him. And I think that was Imam Ali radiallahu anhu. So the, the companion lifted his sword up and this time he wanted to kill him with more aggression. Suddenly he stopped and walked away. He left him and he went away. The companion asked him, why did you leave him? He said, because before I was fighting in the cause of Allah and Allah only commands us in justice. But when he hit me and hurt me, I wanted to kill him out of revenge. But the Prophet ﷺ taught us for 14 years with practice so we may have manners of war. Which religion, which, which society has that as well. So he used to say to them, Behold, we have been sent a people to take the people from the worship of created things to the worship of the creator of all things and to save the people from injustice into the openness and mercy of Islam and to bring justice to the earth. Do not kill an old man of your, amongst your enemies if he is not fighting you. Do not kill a woman who is not fighting you. Wallahi, even if she is in the ranks of the enemies, do not kill a child. Do not cut off the branches of trees. Do not kill an animal. And do not ruin soil. And do not be excessive in killing. Do not mutilate the bodies. And look after the affairs and the conditions of war. And if you hold captives out of this war, then feed them from what you feed from your, fo- your family. And treat them well as you would treat a guest. For they are your captives and you have power over them. And Allah does not like people who have oppression over the weak ones when they have power over them. They caught captives from the wars. Non-Muslims. Wallahi, not one captive was tortured in Islam in those days. And in the later years to come. And one particular kibbani, I forgot his name, Prophet ﷺ brought him and tied him to the pillar of the mosque, of the Masjid al-Madin. Masjid al-Madin. 
Masjid al Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Masjid al Nabawi. And that's what he used to do with the captives. Tie them up, give them food, all the Muslims would come past, smile to him, treat him well, ask him if he needs anything. If he wants to bathe, he can bathe even, wallahi. They'd give him clothes. Just so that he can look and see how the Muslims live their life. Allah says in the Quran, and if a enemy non-believer comes to you to seek refuge, meaning says, listen, you know, I've come to you without any harm. Allah says, then grant him security until he hears the words of Allah. That's all we want to do. We just want you to hear the words of Allah. And then you can go your own way. So he tied him up and they let him hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would reject. Day by day reject. On the third day the Prophet said to them, let him free and let him go back to his land. So the man went free and he left. They gave him a horse and he left. A few kilometers down, the man came back. He got off his horse. And he said to him, I bear witness that, uh, that there is only one God and you are his messenger. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, why didn't you embrace beforehand? He said, do you know what he said? He said, so that people will not think that I embraced Islam out of force because you held me captive. I wanted to embrace Islam to show the world that Islam is just and I became a Muslim out of my own will. Now, Prophet ﷺ was merciful at the day when he came back to Mecca. The first people who initiated the violence towards them and persecuted them and threw them out of their homes and exiled them, the Prophet ﷺ came back with a huge army. And the Meccan people started looking at themselves and saying, what is Muhammad going to do with us? Some of them would say, he is going to kill our men and take our women. He is going to capture our children. He is going to take our homes and torture us. What is he going to do with us? The Prophet ﷺ entered and he said to all of his people, his companions, all of you, lower your swords. And then he called out. He gathered them and he said to them, What do you think that I'm going to do with you? Amongst them was Hind, the one who killed the Prophet's uncle, uh, Hamza. Radiyallahu anhu. When she killed him, the Prophet she opened his chest up and cut off his ears and his eyes and his ear and, and, and tried to eat his liver. And the Prophet when he saw him, he held tightly onto his back teeth and he, and he got teary. And when she became a Muslim, Prophet Sallallahu didn't even look at her or the other man, Hab, uh, Wahshi. But he didn't even hide. He said, what do you think I'm going to do with you? They said, we are at your mercy. The Prophet Sallallahu said, اِذْهَبُوا فَأَنْتُمُ الطُّلَقَاء Go. For you are free people. And whoever enters their home, they are safe. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, because Abu Sufyan, he had a leadership there, he liked being a leader, then he is safe. Idhabu fa'antum tulaqa. That day, he won over all of the Meccans. All of them. And today we see how much Islam there is over there. The Prophet ﷺ was merciful towards the sinners and the ignorant, not like us. As soon as a person says uh, something wrong in Islam, we call him a kafir, a fasiq. A uh, 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 We call him names. An apostate. A rejecter of faith. Kill him, he ought to be killed. <laughs> Islam says so, and I bring you all the dalils, mashallah. But what they lack is understanding what the dalils mean. Inshallah, we've got a lot of scholars here. These days. Not here, yani, in no all over the world, unfortunately. The Prophet ﷺ used to treat the sinners and the ignorant people with too much kindness because he understood when a person doesn't know, then they ought to be taught. A person, a major sinner, came to the Prophet ﷺ saying, Ya Rasulullah, I committed a major, major sin. What should I do? The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Do you have a mother? He said, My mother is dead. Do you have a father? He said, My father is dead. He said to him, Do you have an auntie? Meaning the mother's sister. That's who comes after the mother. He said, yes. He said, burraha. Go and be dutiful and kind to her and Allah will forgive your major sin. Look how much mercy the Prophet ﷺ has. He didn't tell him you ought to be stoned. No. Or that woman who came to Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, I am pregnant from zina. Stone me. Subhanallah. He turned away from her the first time. Maybe she's drunk. Maybe she's ignorant. Giving her a chance to go away and repent to Allah in another way. So she returned back to him. Ya Rasulullah, I am a pregnant woman from zina. Tahirni, purify me. Stone me to death. The Prophet ﷺ turned again away from her. Trying to ignore her the third time. And then a fourth time. 
When she bared witness four times against herself and insisted, he said to her, Go back until you give birth to the baby that's in your stomach. What has he done? Why should he die with you? So she returned. And in the hope, the Prophet is hoping that she will not return and ask Allah to pardon and forgive her because Allah is merciful. And to hide it. Nine months later she returned, ya akhwan. And she said to him, He is my child, now purify me. The Prophet looked and said, Go back until the child has been... Until the child no longer needs your breast milk. He needs your breast milk. So she left and after two years, talking about two years and nine months, she returned back to the Prophet ﷺ. When Prophet ﷺ saw that she was insistive on it and she wanted the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they took her and she was stoned. And then the people, they thought, like, they, they felt like she's a bad woman. When the Prophet ﷺ saw this attitude, he stood up before everybody and made a legacy for her which lasts till today until the last hour. He said, Wallahi, لَقَدْ تَابَتْ هَذِهِ الْمَرْأَةُ تَوْبَةً لَوْ زَنَ أَهْلُ الْمَدِينَةِ لَوَسِعَتْهُمْ Wallahi, this woman has repented such a repentance that if all the people of Medina were to commit the same zina and you were to place it on the scale, her repentance would have overcome them all. Not one of them will equal her. Abadan. The Prophet ﷺ was merciful to all the people. What about the Bedouin man who entered the masjid one time when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting the companions were around him? He felt like going to the toilets of the Bedouin, a rude man, and he doesn't understand. He went to one of the corners of the masjid and started to urinate. Just went to the corner and just began urinating in the middle of the, in the masjid. Well, the companions who were still not ready for that, they took out their swords. <laughs> <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ said, لا دعوه. No, 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 let him finish. <laughs> Wallahi, he said, let him finish, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the man finished, he said, bring some water and clean it up. And he called the man aside. And he addressed him with such a kind manner that this Bedouin has never heard it from even his mother ever. How compassionate is the mother? He never even heard it from his mother. Finally, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, and I can't describe the way he said it, he said, it is normal for a human being to need to urinate. But this place has not been set for such an act. The Bedouin looked up at him and cried. Bedouin doesn't cry, hardly cries, and said to him, Bi Abi Anta wa Ummi Ya Rasulullah. I sacrifice everything I have for you before my mother and father, a messenger of God. Subhanallah. Aisha radiallahu anha once questioned the Prophet. She said to him, Ya Rasulullah, does Allah know all the secrets, even no matter even if we, we spoke in secret? She actually didn't believe. That Allah knows all the secrets. Aisha radiallahu anha. Now, wallahi, there's a true hadith. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't say, Kafarti ya Aisha, you're an apostate. How dare you say that? Allah knows all the secrets. No. He said to her, Naam ya Aisha. Yes. He's educating her. The Prophet ﷺ was so kind to the children. I'm sorry if I'm taking a bit of time, but I like to shorten the question and answer time because I don't really like them too much. Sorry to say that. I like to talk more about this a little bit more, inshallah. The Prophet ﷺ, he was so kind to the children, to his wives, and to the women in general. First, I begin with the children. Maybe you haven't heard this particular incident before. Wallahi, it really pleases me. A young boy, only about probably 11 or 12 years old, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, he used to have a pet bird. What did he have? A pet bird. And he used to love this bird. And he called it a name. I think, I'm not sure, Subhanallah, I forgot the name. If someone can correct me. I think its name was... What was it? an nughair Jazakallahu khair. The bird's name was an nughair Prophet ﷺ knew how the boy liked an nughair and Prophet ﷺ used to you know, share his, his joy with him. One day an nughair died, the bird died. And the boy was very sad. The Prophet ﷺ packed, put his clothes on, got up and headed towards the young boy. Where are you going ya Rasulullah? He said, I am going to, uh, to pass my condolences on to the boy and make him feel comfortable and happy because he lost a beloved of his. I just remembered my culture, the you know, Lebanese culture. If a boy was crying for his bird, they'd say, Get out of here, it's just a bird. <laughs> Kick it aside, put it in the rubbish, burn it. <laughs> you suck. That's what they would say. 
Okay, we have to wrap it up insha'Allah But I really would like to say this last thing Because of Maghrib Can I say this last thing brother? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam One of the first things that he did And this is a message out to the people who say That Muslims mistreat their women And look at the women and females as a lower class than the men I am talking about John Howard. <laughs> MashaAllah, he went to the extent of writing a book that m- Muslim men. I have to agree with him with one little tiny bit. And I'm not trying to be save myself from anything here. Some Muslims, not because of their Islamic nature, it is because of their cultural nature, wherever they're from, wherever you're from. Cultural nature. My Arabic nature, for example. Yes, some of them, wallahi, are very, very wicked to their wives and very wicked to their daughters. And they mistreat the daughters and they favor the boy and they wish that the daughters were dead. Now, wallahi, this is true. So in a way, I don't blame John Howard. But I wish that he would have just asked for crying out, you're the Prime Minister of the country, you can enter any masjid you want. No one will kill you, don't worry. Just ask. Muslims are not known to do these things. So, one of the first things the Prophet ﷺ did was that he abolished the favorism of boys above girls. The Arabs in those days, they used to bury their daughters alive. They used to practice female infanticide. It's a criminal act of killing your baby daughter. And don't think that this act is not practiced today in some countries. I do not want to mention which countries as to not offend some people of that country who who may be sitting here. But this is actually practiced, the killing of young females, whether they are in the fetus or whether they are one year old or two years old, they kill them. They kill them, Wallahi al-Azim. Because they have a culture. And the culture is that the boy carries on the name of the family. And when a a woman gets married, she has to be a part of the husband's family. Whereas in Islam, the woman must keep her father's surname. Did you know that? When she gets married, like I'm Asad, my wife is Hablus, she still maintains her surname, her father's name. Allah says in the Quran, اُدْعُوهُمْ لِآبَائِهِمْ هُوَ أَقْصَطُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Call them by their father's names. This is most just in the eyes of God. Which religion has that? Which? Come on. Which system has that? Not one. To make her independent of her own name? The first thing he abolished was the burying of them alive. I will tell you this story. A man that existed amongst the companions, he used to, like you'd see him talking normal and smiling or laughing. And then suddenly at occasions, he would start to cry and cry so much until he went unconscious. The companions told the Prophet ﷺ about this man to try and read on him for healing. So the Prophet ﷺ called this man and wanted to help him. He took him aside and said, what, what, what happens to you, my brother? The man said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I was never going to tell anyone this, but now that you've asked me, I must tell you. Before I embraced Islam, I used to have a daughter. And when she was born, I wanted to bury her. Because the cultural ideology came into my mind. And I started to think that when she grows older, she will bring shame to my family. But I stopped myself. My heart for my daughter was overpowering me. Years and years went went by as I watched her grow. And then one day, when she reached close to a blossoming age, she was about to become a lady. He said, I began to have nightmares and desperation and distress. The pain of my culturalism came into me, thinking of the shame that my daughter is going to bring with me if she walked off with another fellow and brought shame to all my ancestors. Day by day, I wanted to do something, but then my heart, my love stopped me. Until one day, he said, I could not handle it anymore, Ya Rasulullah. I said to her mother, 
dress her up with, a, with neat clothes and comb her hair nicely and decorate her face and tell her your father today is taking you out to a party, a celebration, so that she can play with the other friends of hers. The mother knew that the father was up to a plot and a plan. So she dressed her daughter up. She combed her hair while she was crying. The mother was crying. And she powdered her face and made her nice while the mother was crying. The daughter's asking, what's wrong mother? And the mother would say nothing, daughter. She's not allowed, otherwise the husband will beat her. Or probably even kill her. The daughter said, daddy's taking me out for a celebration. I love my dad. After, after decorating her, the father came along in the evening. And he took his daughter. The wife grabbed, the prophet, grabbed her husband's hand and said to him, and whispered to him, but his daughter could hear. And she said some words that made his heart shiver and the, word, and the daughter to remember. لا تضيع الأمانة يا رجل O man, do not lose the trust. Your daughter is your trust. The man took his daughter away. And on his way, he's thinking to himself, what am I going to do? And the daughter is playing around her father, thinking that her father loves her. He said, I approached a very deep well, which was steep and deep, and it had rocks, sharp rocks at the bottom. He said, suddenly the pains and agonies of my culturism came and burnt me. And I began to think, should I throw her? Should I not throw her? So I would come close, then my heart would not let me. Suddenly the culturalism would come in. He said, I wrestled and wrestled. Suddenly, when I came close to the well, I grabbed my daughter and I threw her into the well. And my daughter held with her open, horrific eyes, looking at me and saying to me, Daddy, لا تضيع الأمانة. Oh, Dad, don't lose the trust. Don't lose the trust, Daddy. And the, Prophet, and the man then threw her into the well. He said, Ya Rasulullah, she kept falling, saying, لا تضيع الأمانة, Ya, Rab- ya, Ras- ya Abi. لا تضيع الأمانة, until her tiny voice went away. And I couldn't hear her anymore and she died, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ looked up at him and his beard was soaked with tears. ﷺ. And the Prophet's beard was soaked with tears and he said to him, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to allow me to punish anyone for the killing and murder of anyone before Islam, I would have started with you. I would have started with you. The Prophet ﷺ was the most compassionate, even to the women. And he used to say to them, Mahlam bil qawarir, take care of your precious pearls, your daughters and your wives. Stawsu bin nisa'i khayra. Have kindness towards your wives and be patient with them. Be patient with them for they make a lot of mistakes and you are not infallible. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you see a bad habit of hers, then remember the good things that she does and overcome that with that and forgive her for her ill comings. He also used to help his wives clean and sew and sometimes even cook Wallahi al-Azim and look after the children when they were tired except when prayer came Aisha said it's as if the Prophet ﷺ didn't know us he had to remember his Lord the Prophet ﷺ used to, his first love was Khadija radiallahu anha and she, he never got married to another woman until Khadija radiallahu anha died but in her time he loved her the most and after her he loved her the most until one time Aisha radiallahu saw the Prophet ﷺ sitting with an old woman old woman probably in her 70s and he was talking and laughing like enjoying some stories just stories and Aisha radiallahu got jealous subhanAllah she was very young got jealous of this old woman so she came to the Prophet ﷺ and said to him Ya Rasulullah you know woman tilka al-ajuz who's that old woman? you know old and she's young that's what she's trying to say the Prophet ﷺ laughed and he said she was one of suwahibatu Khadija she was one of the friends of Khadija radiallahu anha, which brought an even heavier burden on Aisha radiallahu What? He still remembers his wife and she's dead? He said, she said to him, a friend of Khadija's, he said, but didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you someone better? She means herself. <laughs> the Prophet sallam put a straight face on immediately. And he said to her, لا والله لم يبدلني الله خيرا منها By Allah, Allah did not Replace Khadija radiallahu anha with anyone better than her. Which means you Aisha. For she is the one who gave victory to me when everyone else left me. She is the one who believed me when everyone else said I'm a liar. She is the one who clothed me and put the blanket on top of me when I was shivering and thinking that I had been hypnotized by some devil. And she said to me, 
You are a truthful man, an honest man who gives the poor and looks after the needy. Allah will not, never let you down. So she supported me when everyone else left me. And, to top the cake, he said, and Allah gave me from her daughters and sons. Aisha radiallahu anha couldn't have any children. Aisha radiallahu anha understood her mistake and said, Ya Rasulullah, forgive me and ask Allah to forgive me. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I have run out of time. If you give me time in the questions and answers, I can answer why we love the Messenger Sallallahu the most. As for now, I will leave you inshaAllah with that. Come back inshaAllah to hear the, the, the answer to that question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.